Hey everybody, we're back with JJP at Puig Child Studios. I'm very excited to be back here, thank you. My pleasure. As usual, by the way, you're looking incredibly dapper. Oh, thank you. <laughs> now, just off camera, you did point to this rather beautiful mic up here. Oh, the American microphone. Yeah, this is a... Uh... This is really a great microphone, the American microphone. And uh, actually a guy named John Bryan and I sort of discovered it at the same time together. This is a microphone um, that was used for criminal. Uh, so that whole criminal Fiona Apple sound, it's just mm -hmm. this microphone. Uh, a microphone on the bass drum and this um, through a couple compressors and stuff. But this is a great microphone. Y you can find them, um, but you have to like go through quite a few usually to get them because it's an old ceramic capsule. And, you know, they don't last long. Oh, they don't? No, but when they're right, they're really cool sounding. I oh, see so you have two. Yeah, I have got <laughs> actually five. Oh, wow. Well, I have two here and three put away. But uh, they're also just beautiful. I was about to say, they look like trophies. They do. That's why it's <laughs> up there. It's just like an oh, American microphone. It's a beautiful mic. It's gorgeous. It's a fantastic microphone. Now, I noticed in the back of the room, we've got the, uh, the bookcase which serves two purposes. One, one, it has absolutely gorgeous books all over it. It's a great display, but I'm assuming also for, for Sonics as well. Yeah, for deflective purpose. This room I built uh, in such a way where it's a little bit live, um, certainly liver than you would have in a normal control room, but this is how people listen to music. Right. So I thought, I'm gonna experiment with the idea if the room is more like actually how people listen. Because I don't know who sits behind a pair of Venice 10s, mm -hmm. right, dead center, like, I don't know who does that. I don't. Just us. My next door neighbors don't do that. That's <laughs> not how they listen to music. They listen to it this way, in a room like this. So that's uh, why this room is like this. Okay, so your listening environment's pretty fantastic. I love this sort of uh, semi sort of hexagonal thing. It reminds me actually of the, uh, the 10 cc uh, Helios. That's, the way exa that's, exa that's, a, that's exactly <laughs> what was in my mind. Helios. I love that photo of them sitting I think there. Helios might be one of the most coolest, sexiest looking console yeah. ever. <laughs> I mean, really it's like good. a spaceship, those Helios consoles. Yeah. So you've got, from the left here, I see you have some SSL channels. You know, the SSL equalizer is almost impossible to be from a perspective of how granular it can be. You know, it's, it's very, very clear, you know, and, and you can really get detail uh, that you can't get almost with nothing. Uh, so that's why I have those. And they have, you know, obviously they have a certain sound. I've always been a person who likes to sort of create collages. And I'm not the only person, of course, lots of people do this, but my whole life I've always liked putting different sounds together, you know, to make something like a collage, Amazing. essentially. What do you find yourself most often using these on? Uh, I, in my opinion, it's fantastic for guitar and really any kind of percussive element, pretty hard to beat. If you have something that you really need a lot of detail on, it's, again, really fantastic. I mean, obviously, the, I think the plug-in versions of these are absolutely fantastic as well. You, know, you don't have to have this. But you like the tactile feeling of having a fader uh, and everything? Well, the analog version you know, yep. still has a, a different uh, sensibility than the digital version. And that's pretty much true, really, almost for any kind of, uh, really, analog versus digital. It's still a little bit different from each other. Right, right. Uh, but they both have their, their beauties. They both have positive things about them. Great. In my opinion. And I love these guys, some Spectrosonics on the top here. Yeah, those are Spectrosonic submixers. Uh, so there's six and six left and right. Um, and that's part of the semi network. And then this here is actually also really the main summer. That is something I had built for me. It's all point-to-point -point analog. I went through listening to every summer I could think of uh, about a year and a half ago, two years ago, and I couldn't find anything that built this. We built this 15 years ago. <laughs> so it was the Mastering Lab brains that built this. It has API transformers in it. It Beautiful. has uh, some of the same amplifiers you find in a uh, Ampeg 102. Um, and then, but it's hot rotted, and again, it's all basically wire. It's just it's as close as you can get to no electronics. Uh, but I have multiple outputs, so I have this as one stage, but I also have uh, the Neve 
if I want that sound. Okay. So that's what you find in the output of the Neve console. Where are you selecting that from? All of this uh, is routed through different buses uh, on the IOs so that I can easily say I want this kind of an output or this kind of input, including tube output, whatever I want. It's always all a little bit different. You know, Do you find sound. yourself mixing and then at the very end choosing, or you're making that dis decision at first? Uh, usually pretty first. I at can first. tell. Yeah, because I like to mix into things. Right. You know, right. In, in my opinion, I want to I know in the very beginning kind of where I'm going. Right. Tell me, what are these? This one says BBC and EMI. <laughs> yeah, they were, diff they were amps. One came from BBC and one came from EMI. Yeah. Uh, they're RCA tube amplifiers that were generally used to drive uh, line levels. So they would have like in one room, one of these amplifiers, and it would drive a speaker in another room. Ah, I see. For whatever reason, right? right? For different applications. Yep. What I'm doing with these two is that they sit uh, on the bus that the guitars always go through. Ah. And it adds everything that you can imagine with massive transformers and tubes like this, um, a weight to the guitars that you don't hear. So now that we're in this digital world, you know, the, the, the idea of putting the two together is fantastic because mm -hmm. you get the fast speed of what digital is in terms of the rise time, very tacky and punchy. And with this, you get some of the harmonic distortion that we like and the weight, you know? Yep. And so I'm kind of getting a little bit of both that I really like. In fact, amazing on acoustic guitars, right? So a lot of what I have here, I have a particular setups where these I, I'm putting on the electric guitars for the most part. The Collins compressors you see back there, those big ones, I run the acoustics generally through that. So I'm still all in, in the box, but mm -hmm. I'm pushing out certain channels that go to some of these things, and they live there because I know that they're going to really work great on acoustic. I know that really looks great on electric because I've modified them, I've worked on them to get them to be really, really great. No, nothing here you see is stock. If we were to lift this up and look underneath it, it's got all different kinds of parts and capacitors. It's all been thought through, listened to, modified, right. measured. The feedback loop has the right amount of harmonic distortion. I mean, there's a lot of. I, I when I first, very very first started, the way studios got business, right, is that they would have a sound, and so mm -hmm. you would go to a studio for their sound, right. Of course, when the SSL came, uh, and NS10s, then everything became the same. But back then, when I very, very, very first started, where I hardly knew anything, there were these studios that were famous for certain things, to the point where they would take gear and they would modify it and lock it down. I remember LA2s, that they actually drilled holes in the front and screwed them, so you could not open them up, and they covered the backs. And they would modify them. And so you would go to that studio, because like, oh, they got this LA2, mm -hmm. or this chamber, or this, whatever it is, a console, that had a thing. And you could only get it there. And that's how they competed with each other, right? So that mentality is something I've always adopted. And, and that's what we have here, where these are not just RSA amps, but they're modified. These are not just Collins. They're modified, right? These are not just, these look like 1073s, but they're 1079s, but they're modified, you know? These General Electric amplifiers, you know, the stuff you see back here, you know, all of this stuff. These stay levels are not stay levels. They're stay levels, but they're not stay levels, right? They've, you've got in them and taken out parts, changed things, listened to them to find what the best, the, how they can sound the best they can, right? Well, I, I totally relate. I always talk about, um, and I've used this analogy a lot for, for people watching, is my crappy piano. Like I have a, a, a Baldwin student model. But you know what's great about that? Is it's my crappy piano. That's right. One of the problems or realities, I should say, with digital is like, when you and I first started, for instance, you know, we all wanted to go to the Vienna Concert Hall and hear the Steinway. Well, they went a few years ago and sampled that Steinway, absolutely beautiful. Now everybody has access to the most perfectly recorded, best sounding Steinway piano ever. Just use that as an analogy. That's basically C7s, everything. You can get perfection. What you can't get is the wrongness, is my crappy piano, your modified you know, pieces of equipment. I, I believe that that is a huge deal because um, access to digital stuff is wonderful, but it does mean that we all have access to exactly the same thing. Yeah, so what you want is you want the character. Yep. You know, if we're all on a DAW yep. like this, it all sounds the same. We're all using the same thing. Yep. 
and obviously we have our own artistic show, but you know, these 610 modules you see down here, yeah. UA 610 modules. I mean, the one to the far right, well, the one to the far left is, the, is actually the prototype, very first prototype. Right. Uh, but these here, like for instance, if I send the bass drum to it and push it really hard, you know, it folds in a, in a really cool way. Mm -hmm. I mean, stuff you could do like, I guess with, I don't know, any amplifier or plug-in sure. or maybe even a sans amp or whatever. But that folds in a certain kind of way because it's UA and, you know, those things sounded amazing. And you're just going to add that in and create, you know, a sound that you can't get. You can only get it with that. So it's yep. unique character. Yep. And I love doing that. I, I do this with the Mavic over here too, these Pultic Mavics. I do that with the snare drums a lot. So these right here are Pult what they call Mavics. They are a tube mic preamp. Pultic bike preamp. You can see how they look like a Pultic, but they're they do, yeah. but they're called a Mavic, and that's their, they're literally their mic preamp. Oh wow! Um, so they're tube mic preamps. I lots of times will run the snare into them. Um, additionally, you know, in other words, uh, a set, you know, side chained, and push it really hard, and you can get like incredible, like punch, brightness. Uh, how hard you put it can distort, elongate the note, change the feel. Um, I really like using a lot of this gear that way, mm -hmm. you know, as, as for color. Um, and so that's what these do. The Altics you see in the top are, are also what uh, basically been modified to be exactly like the famous Beetle Abbey Altic compressors. Right. That, and they have the Abbey, as you can see, the knobs beneath all the meters. They have the Abbey Road uh, modifications. The Wonderful. Collins I just talked about over there, which are good for the, you know, really good for a lot of things. I first learned about those when I worked with uh, an artist called Kenny Loggins because he has a kind of a, a lot of mid-range in his voice. And those are very smooth sounding. That's where I learned about those. But I now have put them, they kind of live, as I said earlier, on the acoustic guitar. They're really good for acoustic guitar. So what that does, it allows me to come out of the, my dedicated acoustic two channels and my in my template, and I can feed that and it come back. And so now I have everything that's great about digital, like yeah. a lot of people do. This is nothing really unique. Um, and then I have the sound of the of those tube compressors, which sound beautiful on acoustic guitar. Wonderful. Those in particular, because they have a, l a lot of harmonics. I call harmonics the rainbow of the sound. Mm -hmm. That's how I see it. It's the rainbow. It's the beauty um, that you can't even describe. That, Crazy. That, that magic which tubes have in spades, right, harmonic distortion. Couldn't help notice you've got a disco boombox. Yes, uh, I, love this. I have a bunch of them. Oh, you do? Yeah, I have two No wonder two I can't ones. get one. <laughs> They're fantastic, uh, really, really great. I learned about those from, actually, from a, another engineer who, who did a lot of work for Livid Newton-John. Mm -hmm. This was always used on the kick and snare uh, in the earlier days when you didn't have subharmonic, right, plugins like we do now. Yep. That thing is, it's pretty nuts. I, I only ever used that when I was working with uh, Dave Sardi. He had one. Oh, did he? I have the the 120, which is the yep. more modern version. I have a 120 used. somewhere. Uh, that's right there. That's a ah. 120. But I was always very envious. The 500. Then they made it both sides, rack mount like that and half size. Yeah. Uh, there's another rack mount version of that behind one of these racks. So uh, I have two of them, and they're they're fantastic. Uh, I have, you know, this is a pretty. I've always liked this compressor. A lot Name of people, connections. Yeah, a lot of people like it, especially really good for background vocals. You know, it's really good on background vocals. These are beyond amazing. They're, as you know, they're mastering compressors. They weren't made, they weren't, we weren't supposed to have them. They were for mono lathes. But I've had them since I can remember. I think I've been using these for 25 years. Something wow. like some amount of crazy amount of time I've been using them. Um, what do you find yourself using them on? Drums. On drums. So that Led Zeppelin. Uh, very wheezy, compressed movie sound, dynamic sound. They do that really, 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 really well. I, I love them. Fairchild, of course. Joe Meek, 1073. I see a lot of compexes. Uh, I am a compex <laughs> fanatic. I know, I see two here, three, two. Yep. four and over that's there. A, yep, and yeah. then two more here. And two more there. <laughs> yeah. They're pretty hard to beat. Uh, the thing about these is I think the reason why they've never really massively taken off, it's a few of us that like them, is the equalizer is radical. I mean, it's radical. I mean, it's so aggressive. 
that I think it's probably the reason why I never took off. Like this piece here, which is an Orange County, um, this was prior to audio design. So this is the first, these people designed it first, and as you can tell, they're very similar. Right. But this is the same thing where like, it's even much more radical than an SSL. I mean, when you push low end or when you push top end, it's like, I mean, it's radical. So I think it's dangerous. You know, the thing about a 550A, mm -hmm. it's pretty hard to mess up. Sure. You know, it's 2 dB clicks. Well, for me, there was something magical about these, but it always took me an hour to get to it. I'm sure you know them inside out. You I love them so much that I can go fast on them. Yeah, but, See, but, but that's because I learned. Yeah. I had your three to six hour thing. You, you're talking, you're exa I'm yeah. exaggerating, but I went through that. Yeah. But I got to know them really fast right. because I love them so much because they're so expressive. All I remember is using them on a, a drum room mic and like playing around and like, what is it so special about this? The first time I did it. And then getting to this point of just pure magic. And it took me so long. I was like, said to everybody, I was like, assistant, take photos, make notes, don't touch this. You know, it's definitely one of those pieces for me yeah. at least. If you get it right, it's, it's almost impossible to beat. I, there's nothing else that does it. The transient designer uh, obviously is fantastic. These B and B equalizers uh, are very, very rare. They're probably the most resolute um, equalizer I have. They're very, very resolute. They have 351 uh, S chips in them, which are what a lot of the earlier stuff had when we first when we first went from transistors to chips. And they're amazing, clean, beautiful just detailed beyond description. I don't know that you can beat the 2016. I love even tied in their uh, products. Uh, that 2016 mm -hmm. is hard to beat. I worry about the day that it breaks. Because <laughs> they break. Oh, they do? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, they break a lot. And I'm always like, oh, how long do I have it? Because they're notorious for breaking. Mm. And once they break, it's kind of kind of over. Have you ever swapped out, um, what do they call it? The, uh, the proms? Yeah. Yes, I have. Yeah. This is a really good one. Uh, this was chosen out of eight. A lot of my equipment, I was able to choose it out of a whole bunch of them because at the time when I acquired most of this, A, it was inexpensive, and B, there was a lot of it, and no one really cared. Right. You know, so like the 2254s down here. Yep. I picked those. I was at Schnee Studio, uh, and I auditioned 14. There mm -hmm. were 14 they were selling, and I picked these two out of 14. But never happened now. Mm -hmm. But back then, there were just so many of them. You know, at the 1176s, I chose those out of 10. It was 10 and 12, I remember, those exact numbers. And I chose those two really were the best out of the 10. Those 10. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying there's not other ones better, but out of those 10, those were the two best ones. We were just talking about this earlier, because I, I know Joe Zook has one of these because of you. And he was telling me he learned it from you. So this is uh, a blonder tongue. Yeah, it's not really made for what we're supposed to do with it. It's a minus 10 and minus 10 out. We right. obviously live in a plus four world. Yep. So that's a headroom issue. Yep. But I've had built a really great converter to go from plus four down to minus 10 and then back up to plus four. I'm using this on um, bass. Oh, wow. It's really, really great on bass. So what I'm doing with the bass is I'm coming out of the Pro Tools. I go to this guy. And then I go into this compressor here. This compressor, this Collins compressor, is insane. And as you can see, uh, well, it's hard to see in here, but this is, it's all valve, it's all tube. Mm -hmm. uh, it's beyond weighty and beautiful. And the combination of that blonder tongue equalization and this is my bass chain. I can't beat it. You know, I keep trying different things. Now, mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that I'm not gonna be using plugins. Of course I am. Sure. But just as my basic root thing, it's pretty hard to beat. It's really, really great sounding. A range, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Is there anything more beautiful than that? <laughs> no. Right? And no, the gates stay level. <laughs> Another great one. Collins this mixer, Collins, Collins mixer. console, uh, wow. which I use sometimes. I will, if I want that sound, I'll run. It could be anything. It could be a whole string section. It could be uh, drums. It could be a beat. It could be guitars, whatever. Because uh, that has a sound that's amazing. Again, this is all stuff that has a lot of character and a lot of attitude. Mm -hmm. And especially now the way we're making records, so much stuff is um, samples, right? 
uh, or, instruments. Or, or virtual instruments. Mm -hmm. And I think those things are all amazing. Don't misunderstand me. But sometimes you can add a color with some of these things. That's fantastic. And sometimes it sucks. Sometimes you put it on, you're like, eh, that sounds soft and old, not working. Mm -hmm. Other times you put it on, it's like, whoa, there it is. You know, probably returning actually back to what they were trying to sample. These compressors are really great down here as well. Those are electrodynes. Oh, electrodynes, wow. Yeah, I got attracted to those because of their 30 to 1 ratio. Pretty mm -hmm. intense, right? Most things, as you know, don't have a 30 to 1 ratio. So it's some ways between a compressor and a limiter, kind of, yep. which is really fantastic. And then the SSL. Stay level means no introduction. Yep. <laughs> I mean, I would say the stay level to the preset, what I call the preset generation, is probably what a Fairchild is to me. Right. They love, well, I would say the new generation of record makers are stay level fanatics. Probably the number one. We didn't fall in love with them very much. People in my era didn't fall in love with them as much as. I used to hear people talk about using them. On, they used to like them on backgrounds mm -hmm. just to. But that's how they were. They were sort of like, oh yeah, I put them on the backgrounds. Yeah. Like yeah. backgrounds aren't important. I mean, so right. to speak, if you know what I mean. Sure. Yeah. They were never put on the like lead vocal or. Yeah. And I am using this on the lead vocal. I use it. I come out of the Pro Tools into 1073 into this and then into another one and back. And that just does crazy things to the beauty of a vocal. I mean, it's fantastic. Uh, the Manly? Manly's, you know, passive. I've always liked that. Yep. The Longevin tube amplifiers you see down there in the bottom, those blue oh, ones, yep. those tubes. More tube stuff. I, I like a lot of tube stuff very much. I'm always liked. I, I love harmonic distortion. Again, I think it's the rainbow of sound. Mm -hmm. I think that's the beauty of the extension that that creates those harmonics, you know, based on the root that go up that just sounds so beautiful. It's the rainbow. And when you get that right, that's how you get, for lack of a better description, that THX, you know, where it's just all mm -hmm. beautiful from the bottom to the top. And now we have harmonic generators, right, and plugins. How did you get these pieces of an EMI console here? <laughs> that's pretty phenomenal. So I was working in London. Yeah. And I a studio called Metropolis. I was there a couple of weeks ago. And a guy came yep. up to me that was uh, one of the guys in the tech department. Yeah. And I had a lot of the stuff I'd actually taken with me because all this has flown with me everywhere. Seattle, Nashville, London, France. I mean, it's been everywhere. I don't even know how they're still standing, frankly. Mm -hmm. It says a lot about Anvil cases, actually. Um, and the guy saw this. He saw what I was doing. And he came to me. He said, I have a bunch of EMI modules in my garage. Oh, God. I want to give them to you. Wow. And I want to give them to you because I can tell that you really care about sound and you really care about tone. Yeah. You should have them. That's how I acquired them. Wow. How did he acquire them? He worked at EMI. Right. Before he worked at Metropolis, I, I mean, years ago, I imagine he was an older gentleman. I, I don't know if he's even still alive because this was a while, quite a while ago. When I was at uh, Abbey Road a few weeks ago, they told me that they used to take the old consoles and give them to schools, universities, and colleges. So, so it was like the old gear that left like this, the TG stuff and everything, they would just donate it for educational purposes when they put like an SSL in. And that stuff is, I have to explain to you how good that is. Yeah. It, I mean, it's, there are other producers and other mixers that will tell you who do have maybe one module or two, you would have to pry it out of their hands. Once you've worked with that, I think it's pretty hard to beat. There's, I mean, all that EMI stuff is just so crazily good. It's so fantastic. I have a monitor here, so um, when I'm working with people, they can sit here in the back, I can be in the front, or even if I'm having someone drive because I'm producing and I want to be focusing on the arrangement and things mm -hmm. of that sort, musical elements, it allows us to feel like we're in the room together. We can see very clearly what's happening here, so it's, it's a mirrored system. I've always had mirrored systems. I think that's really important. I had them um, uh, when we had patch bays and assistants. I even had mirror systems. So I jumped on Pro Tools and the, the very first day it came out. I jumped on it right away because I could see how great it was going to be. And I always had a mirror system, one for the assistant and one for me. And then this environment, of course, is different because primarily there's one of us driving. But this allows us to both be connected in the room and hear really clearly. Charisma. 
you know, I think SPL, yep. they've always made the coolest stuff. Like, I have one of these. Crazy things, yep. right? I mean, yep. but it's it's fantastic. DBX-165 classic. Wonderful, yeah. I don't know if there'd be Bob Clear around without a space station. Right? I know, it's fantastic. <laughs> that, I mean, that's yeah. that's in excess, all that stuff he did. Yeah. Uh, that's just reference standard, in my opinion. And you have two of them. I have two of them, because <laughs> you always need to have a backup. <laughs> And then, of course, the 33264 Neve. I yep. don't know if there's anything better than that. That's a really great compressor. And where are you favoring that? I like those on guitar and voice or snare drum. Great. For, for, between those three, they usually are the best. Um, and when I say snare drum, you know, I say snare drum, but it could be also the right beat. You know, if I'm working on something that has a beat, whatever it is, whatever kind of record I'm working on. I work on all kinds of records. I'm very fortunate that way. And then these are the RCA monitors. They were built in 1959. Already? Oh, um, yes. They're, they came out of Alan Sides' garage. They did. Yeah. And we built this bottom piece you hear here. This was, so the RCA was just from here to here. That's yeah. all they had. And then we built this down here. So for the sub. Yeah. Why this is so great and so unique is that if you look at this very carefully, so you have the mid-range and you have the top end, right? Yeah. No phase issue, because if you look at this and if you look at this, it's exactly the same. Yeah. So that means your ability to hear the slight little nuance in panning, like, okay, that is exactly right there. These are phenomenal for that. I added the Altic tweeters. Um, this is something I'd, I wanted, and I yeah. added because I wanted to be able to hear siblings. You know, right. up really high, like what's happening at 15 and 18, yeah. you know. So I added these just for that very, very, very high end. And there's very little of them being used. Uh, this is a tri-amp system, but with this, is, of course, the fourth amp. But these are so incredibly accurate from a panning perspective. They will play loud, and of course, <laughs> they look like but, but, but that's not what I use them for. You right. know, I don't want to use them for banging. This is not a club. Yeah. Uh, I just want something that's accurate and big. Um, and then the barefoots. I'm using the uh, NS10s as well. You know, NS10s are, I guess, you know, we had overtones years ago, and then we went to NS10s. And I'm using this very unique and hard to come by United Artist amplifier. Secret to NS10s to be really great is a lot of power. NS10s, if you, if you drive NS10s, the best sound of NS10s I think I ever heard had a phase linear 750. Wow. At a studio called Devonshire, um, which doesn't exist anymore. So if you have a lot of power, which means there's a lot of extra energy for swing, and so peak-to-peak -peak information can be easily, you know, spit out effectively. Um, it's really great for instance. Now you got to be smart because you can pull them up, right? So this UA amplifier is 350 watts tube, all tube. And so it really allows me to hear the detail on it in its tens and have a lot of a lot of headroom. So things can swing and move easily so I can hear accurately how things are feeling and how things are moving. Um, and then the barefoots. I'm having a tremendous amount of success with the barefoots. The last, as of late, you know, we go through phases, but right now I'm sort of in my Bernie Grumman phase. And um, I've mastered now five things with Bernie in the last roughly two and a half weeks or so. Nothing. Uh, 0.5 off at something. That's it. So they're very, very, very... I have to say that when I first saw them, I was like, oh, these are kind of weird looking. They kind of put me off by the way they looked, you know? But I knew that a lot of people I respected really liked them. About five of us did some promotion for them, and so they gave them to us, five of us. And I have to say that I opened them up, started using them, and I don't know if I've ever had a pair of speakers that I've been uh, this happy with. Marvelous. You know, where I just keep making the mixes, I keep taking to the master, and they're like, there's nothing to do. So something's right, right? That doesn't Absolutely. generally happen, so I have I'm to sure plenty that. of mastering engineers are happy with mixes and yeah. don't have to do much, but. <laughs> I think the next and most important thing um, that people should be thinking about in these kinds of situations is the stereo bus. Because going back to what I was saying earlier, studios made 
got their customers and kept the customers by their unique sounding rooms, right? And part of that is a stereo bus. And there was a console that was at David Way's studio that actually came from Bill Petrell's place. Mm-hmm. Uh, that Neve that was in the B room was ridiculous. That was a stereo bus modified by George Matzenberg. And when I was working in the very, very early part of my career, when I very first started, I barely knew anything. There were these certain rooms that had quantum consoles and spectrosonic consoles and you know, just different kinds of consoles. And you'd find out that the tech guys would hot rod them. You know, they would listen to them and they would change parts and, and they would hot rod them to get the best sound, the best resolution, the best bandwidth, right? And so I never forgot that. The focus right at A, United Western, or United, I should say, slash Oceanway, it's modified like crazy too. Like, I've had all that modified, stereo bus modified, real aggressively. I've had the mic preamps modified. It's got some SSL parts in it actually, as well as focus, it's a Neve parts. It's a little bit of combination of things. Uh, and so the same things here with the stereo bus. And it gets changed up, but I'm using this one mixer here that's something I built that has a, and I've had this for years. I originally built it for a drum recording. So I'd run, you know, the Tom Toms and the overheads and hi-hat and things when we were putting all that on two channels, right? Back in the days of tape world. You only had a kick snare and then mm-hmm. the rest of the drums were on two channels. Sure. So I had that high resolution thing built back then and then I tried to beat it and I can't beat it. I can't find anything that beats it. And I went through every submixer that is made right now that actually would be much cooler because they had a lot, a lot more better, you know, actually feature sets, bells and whistles. But I can't, I can't find anything better. Do you, do you find, um, are you used predominantly using the submixer because you can insert in all of those? So if you're coming out through there, you're running inserts in there. Or, yeah. or do you use it regardless of inserting? You're just using it because you prefer the sound of going through the, the sound of it. The sound of it, I come out, you know, yep. I have my whole routing that we all do, right? Yep. And I come out of this, and this is always has two, has basically there's three channels, yep. three stereo channels that are coming out of the, out of this into here. Right. And they're dedicated channels to those things with dedicated, so for instance, I think I said earlier, these are on the guitars. And that's two channels. That's five and six. Seven, eight of that mixer are connected to the collins, which are the acoustics, right? And it's always that way. Drums come to one and two. Um, and there's Neve stuff on there. They have an API transformers in the output. Mm-hmm. Or I can select the tube output if I want. Or I, I can select a, a Neve, classic Neve output if I want. And the 1079s always live on the bus. Yeah, pretty, pretty awesome. Once in a while, I will switch and use different things. Um, I have some tube electronics that are modified that are on my stereo bus. So it's a combination of tube and solid state that make the stereo bus. Why the stereo bus is so important is that when you really get a great sounding stereo bus, I mean a really good sounding stereo bus. When I say good, I don't mean clean and perfect. I mean character, right? What happens is when you actually pull up whatever you're mixing, you're like, whoa, sounds beautiful. And so it inspires you. Mm-hmm. If you have a poor sounding stereo bus, you're like searching, why can't I get the feel right? You know, I can't get width, I can't get dimension, I can't get depth, the bass, like I can't get it to pump. It's because you're, you're, you're trying to put it through a small pipe that's crap. But if you have a, a beautiful stereo bus that you've worked on, right, that has some equalization on the top and bottom that's just exactly right and the right tube electronics and the right solid state electronics and everything's just set up right, when you push that up, you're getting something for nothing, effectively. And it, 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 I mean, right away, you're getting makeup, but the right makeup, that sounds amazing. And I should say that Alan Smart, uh, I'm addicted to. I, I got that Alan Smart back in the days, in the 90s. I don't know what number that is. I actually should look someday at the serial number. It's gotta be one of the very, very, very first ones. And the reason why I know that is, I don't know if you know this about Alan Smart, but when he first made these, and this, again, I mean, this might be number seven or three or something like that. So when Alan Smart first put out this compressor, obviously he was doing an SSL. And if you look at that, and if I told you that was an SSL, you'd be like, yeah, SSL knobs, same exact mute button, same light, same color. He got sued. 
Oh, he did. And that's why, if you think about, well, was getting sued. Now, I don't know if what happened with that lawsuit, but what I remember is I got this one, and then I bought a second one, but it was black. Mm. I said, why is it black? Because most of them think people know them as black. Mm-hmm. He said, because SSL told me, you're not using that color gray. We will sue you. Mm. Now, I don't know if they threatened him or went through a lawsuit, but when I got some of the other ones later on, I could never find any of them that are as good as this gray one. I wonder, so when you talk about the fire, yeah, I think that's one of the things that goes out with me. <laughs> when you, if the studio called fire, you got I, I think that's one of the things that goes with me because I can't, how am I going to get another one like that? It, it might be, um, and this is might be, and there's going to be lots of experts who are going to tell me I'm right or very wrong, but it might be also the VCAs because I know the original, original ones were the DBX ones, and, and I know the later ones, off-the-market stuff is, is a... Uh, a remake of those? Yeah, that's the DBX. Yeah, that's probably So the DBX original. was the, they made by far the best VCAs. Right. So all the early consoles that had that kind of automation right. was all DBX. Yeah. They were by far the best. Yeah, because I know with my console, my 4000, they're all DBX VCAs. It's yeah. the best. But that's, you know, it's 80s. Yeah, so that's DBX. Right, that probably explains it. Because I do remember when I was working at, talking of Dave Way's studio, The Pass, I can't remember the text name there. Unfortunately, he died a few years ago, but the tech that worked there. I asked him about that. I was said I had used an Allen Smart and I'd used my SSL. And I said, I couldn't get the Allen Smart to sound just like my SSL in the way I wanted. And this is one of the newer ones. And he gave me this long story about the differences on the VCAs. And I don't know. I'm sure there's people watching this who will know better than I Yeah, do. and I could be, I, I, I know, I'm not an expert either. I know that I'm right in only in that, I'm part of it only because I got this very early on. Right, right. I mean, very, very, very early on because I was always working, you know, primarily on focus writing needs purposely. I didn't want to be on SSL because right. my whole thing was like, well, if I just do it like everyone else. So right. if I work on a focus right or a need or something. Especially that focus right you're working on. Yeah. United, there was nothing like that. If I work on that focus right, yeah. modify the hell of it, have hits on it, yeah. it's my thing. Yeah. Right? Instead of just being because that focus right is not like any other focus. No, no, no. It's modified like insanely like, modified. Like nuts. Yeah. There was actually one modification that could have taken it one step farther, but we we did it at Christmas time mm-hmm. during the Christmas break, and I remember when I came back and heard, I was like, "This is like breathtaking," but we couldn't keep the modification because the ground traces on the circuit boards were too small. Yeah. And it almost caught fire, right. so we had to actually dial and engineer it just slightly. Right. If the resolution was too high, it would sometimes go into oscillation. Oh. So some consoles, as you know, have done that in the past and caught fire because they oscillate. Right. But this guy here, again, I, I got that very early on. And he, Alan built me this, which is like the same thing in the console at the same time. He built that for me. So I could have like the dynamics before I had this little sidecar. So I had some of the SSL flavor because it was never that I thought one thing's better than anything else. I still don't to this day. I just love the idea of like, well, that would be cool if it was SSL and that'd be cool if it was API. Well, it's and a big, it's cool a big part of the and, sound. You know. That bus compressor, I mean. It's incredible. It says SSL when you put it on. Yeah, it's, it, it does. I, I have to say. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just, and I've tried everything on a stereo bus. You name it, I've used it on records to this day and, and had hits with them. But I did, you, did you ever like the Focusrite Red, the early ones? Yes. I've tried Focusrite, I've tried Joe Meek, 2254s, 33264s, LE2s, Fairchild, I, pick, pick it. Mm-hmm. I've done it. Now, of course, in here, I still have a lot of stuff. It's not just that, right? Right. Um, I really like, I think this is a really, really good compressor. If we come here. Nothing that you've never seen before. Oh, you like that? I do. And I'll tell you why I like that very much. Because I really like shaping dynamics. So compression to me, and I won't go into a lengthy thing, but compression to me is the only thing we get to work with that's dynamic. Everything else is static. And equalizer is static. Compressor is dynamic because you can affect time constant, at least in time. You can move things in time. You can make things feel late or early in a bar line, depending on how you set it up. Mm-hmm. This is got transient 
knobs for low end and the top end and dynamic dimension. It's interesting and it really makes a difference. So you can really like shape things more sawtoothy, for mm -hmm. lack of a better description, or square wavy or sine wave. You can actually, you know, take the sine wave and change it from being like a normal sine wave to maybe something that's more picky or squarey, whatever. And that perception of how long something is, is the perception of where something is in time. Mm -hmm. So if we go back to when we first started making records, one of the skills that you had to have was to immediately figure out, oh, a guitar player, he plays on top of the beat kind of. And sure. the drummer plays maybe like this and the bass player plays here and you'd find that spot where it was like, boom, there's the feel, right? I remember mixing a Rolling Stones song on a Friday. I'll never forget it. And I could not make, it was just like, oh my God, this is the, this is the first time I ever worked with the Rolling Stones. I'm like, this is the Rolling Stones. But like, uh, am I going to tell them that we have to like pro tool this? Like it's kind of all over the place. How am I going to tell them that? It's the Rolling Stones. And I kept thinking, I kept thinking. I was like, you know what? I heard Glenn Johns in my head. If it doesn't feel right, pull all the faders down. Bung it, as the British would say, bung it back up. So I did. And I, I pushed it all back up. I was like, Ugh! there it is. Like, if I soloed something, I'm like, that doesn't even sound like it's the same <laughs> tempo. If I take it out, it's like, that's the Rolling Stones, right? Exactly 9 p.m. on a Friday night. I was like, there it is. Now that records are made where you're putting everything exactly on the grid, what I just described is like, kind of like, well, okay, it's sort of a lost art. Like, why do you need to do that? But I still think it's relevant. Sure. So for compression with me, depending how I set an attack and release, I could make the guitar perceptually, mm -hmm. right, feel that it's early or late compared to the beat mm -hmm. or the vocal or the keyboards or the strings, whatever it is, whatever you're working on, percussion, whatever it is. And I can get things to move and wheeze in a certain way as if they were playing together, but they're not really playing together. Now, that's something I've done for years. The DJs discovered it with side chaining. That's how they do it. In some ways, kind of the same, mm -hmm. right? So they're side chaining. They're, the bass drum, every time it hits, makes the bass go lower or whatever, right? We see, I, th I don't think anything does it better than Ableton really does that well. Right. I don't think anything does it. In fact, I think Ableton might be the best sounding DAW. Ableton's a very great sounding DAW, in my opinion. But all that side chaining, you know, uh, is effectively kind of what I'm talking about, transit designing, where you're moving things back and forth, the perception of it. Now, they're doing it by, by the level, right? So if the bass drum hits, the bass comes back. So there, you have this going. As, that's a dumb example, but they're, they're, it's much more involved than that, of course, as you very well know. I like doing it by the way I shape the signal. So the way you identify where something is, right, is by wherever that peak is. So, for instance, low-frequency content. If a semi goes by here, we don't know like, wait, I just heard that semi rumble, but we don't know whether it's in the front of the house or the back of the house or on that street. We can't identify where it is. If I drop a penny on the floor, you go, it's right there. So the high frequency allows you to identify where it is because it has a real aggressive peak where the low frequency takes a long sign where it takes a long time to develop. So you have all that time where is the beginning of that? Where is the end of it? It's so long. Where with a sharp tone, like a snare drum hit, right? Or, or a triangle or something, it's like really fast. You're like, okay, it's right there. Mm -hmm. So that's where it is in the bar line. So if you think of the bar line, if you see the bar in your head and, and, and make eighth notes or even sixteenths or 30 seconds, you can accurately go exactly where that is. So depending on how you shape it with the compression, you can determine where the perception of where that is. That's something I really like doing because now I can change something that might be is at 106 BPM, but it feels like 120 because I'm pushing everything on top of the bar line to make it feel faster, more exciting. This is what you can do. This is the right way to use compression. Level control, like making something really loud, boring, not interested. That's not <laughs> how you use compression. That's like stupid. Well, you're well, you're well past that. That's why. You're it's dynamic. That. Yeah. Why would we not? Don't, it's dynamic. We don't sure. have anything else that's dynamic. Music is dynamic. Well, before we had transit designers, we used to use slightly slower attacks and get pop, pop, pop. Yes. That's how we got it. Yeah. And, that, and that's then 165, 
mm-hmm. is amazing for that. With a, yeah. with a, with a gate, yeah. it's stunning for that. Before we had trans designers, you're correct, yeah. Yeah. 100%. And that's one element to look at it, but what I'm talking about is even like down to the expert page. Right. You know, of moving the attack and release and getting it to move just right where like you have that perception mm-hmm. of it moving in time, dancing. Yeah. And I'm not the only one that does this. I'm not the only one to figure this out. No. It's something I really like. But something you, something you were describing, we talked about off camera as well, and it's very important to talk about, is this is within individual elements of a mix. It works for certain things. It doesn't work for certain things. So sure. we were talking earlier about, well, what happens if the patient goes bub up? Yeah. Hey, you're 100% right. Yeah, yeah. You know, if you have straight fours at 120 beats per minute, sure. well, it's going to, that's locked. Yeah. Right? So... There are exceptions, but yeah. basically speaking, it's the most dynamic piece of equipment that we have. Sure. There's nothing else that's that dynamic, right? It's all static. And so I love compression. And as you can see, I own a tremendous amount of them, but not, not, not to make level, not to make level for well, feel. But I also see a lot of things that are coloration. Like that, everything there for me is coloration. That's all coloration. Yeah. And I suppose, yes, that's the other thing about compressors. Is that if you've got a tube compressor, it's doing so much more than even just uh, compressing the signal anyway. Right. I'm sure there's a piece of equipment that you run through just for the sake of running through it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah they all have, I mean, that way with microphones and then with mic preamps, you know, over here are the European APIs. See those four down there? That's the European version. Oh, I've never seen those before. Yeah, that's not American. There was a European API mic preamps that are beautiful sounding. So... I can use those. The flanger, the MXR flanger and phaser you see there? Yep. Bob Claremountain. That's what he used to use on his Sens. Oh, wow. So a lot of those records that have those really great delays that he learned from Rhett Davies, mm-hmm. right? It was a Rhett Davies Avalon Claremountain time. Yeah. Uh, he used a lot of times he'll send a vocal through a delay and then the flanger or the phaser is on the delay. The MXR, a little cheap flanger. Mm-hmm. Amazing. Yeah. Oh, you, they're... Do you just use it super slow, just so? Right. Yeah. Right. Now, the reason why I bring that up is next to a compressor, that might be the only other thing I can think of that can create the perception of something moving in time. Mm-hmm. Perception. Yeah. Right? Um, well, Jack said he was doing that in the, in the 70s on snare drums. Exactly. Like boo, boo yeah. on the snare. Yeah. <laughs> um. You can get that with the UAs when I was talking about them on the kick and snare. If you overdrive them real hard, they'll do that. You know, because the transformers in them and the tubes start to bloom. Yeah. And when they, I use the word bloom, I think yep, that's an accurate see. term. When they bloom, they kind of just have this elongated, mm, right. right? And you put that underneath a fast attack and the bass drum all of a sudden just feels like, like a 26 inch bass drum as opposed to 18 inch bass drum. Right. Right. So no longer is it R&B, now it's like bottom because the length of the note. Great. That goes back again to sort of the compression overdriving some of these things yep. concept. I mean, basically, some of these things are sans amps effectively before they were sans amps sure. on steroids. Yeah, but all completely random. Right. But I mean, they're the same thing because yeah. you're, you're overdriving this stuff and it's, it's creating those crazy sounds that you can get. You know, because if you think about it, sans amp, or uh, there's other ones. Uh, um, Lo-fi. I mean, any lo-fi. of them. Lo-fi. I love lo-fi, yeah. I love lo-fi. Or, 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 I mean, all of those are distortion machines, yeah. effectively. And these can become distortion machines, but they're a different kind of distortion machine. Because, mm-hmm. for instance, the Mavic I was talking about earlier has equalization. So it's not like I'm just overloading the mic preamp. You know, I'm EQing it. And I may bring it back and EQ it again, and I might compress it, and I might put a transient designer on it, etc. Did, it, did we already talk about this crazy looking thing up the top there? What so is that? I've been experimenting with something that I, I, I know is going to sound nuts. No, oh, no, nuts okay? is good. No, it's going to sound, it's, you're going to think I'm crazy. I guarantee <laughs> it. Watching TV one night and I was watching uh, and the commercial came and they were talking about these beauty products. Mm-hmm. Um, and they still see them to this day. That they use like LED technology and they show the woman and she's got this like wand and she's putting it on her face and supposed to take out the wrinkles. And then they show this LED technology and I was looking at it going, so that means that different LEDs, red, purple, green, whatever, Mm -hmm. emit a different kind of ray. What if I was to insert that underneath the tube? Hmm. What would that do? What would 
I see. What would that do if I, guess and? what? I have not perfected it. Right. I've had to put this project on the wayside, but it does. It affects the sound. Great. So I've been playing. I don't with, think you're crazy. I think you're having fun. I've been playing with, with good that. ideas. <laughs> well, it's just it's just the constant fun thing about what yeah. of creation. You know, yeah. like what can I do with these different tools? You know, whether I, it's the brand new plugins or the old stuff, like all of it. It's all fun. Whatever it is, if it's part of the process which makes the end result better, that is all that matters. Hundred percent. You know what I mean? It's like you have to stand on one leg to record an acoustic guitar. Hundred percent. I don't know. I mean, some of it is obvious, isn't it? I remember Don Smith, God rest his soul, we were having a problem with my singer. She couldn't get the timing right on the vocal. And we, everyone was getting frustrated. And Don's like, how did you write this song? And well, I didn't get to see you live. How did you do it? And she's like, oh, I play guitar and sing. And he's like, oh. So he goes in, gives her an electric guitar, tapes up the strings. You know what I'm going to say. Put some cotton under there. I said, play guitar. So she started singing and playing guitar. And suddenly she was in time because this action was all part of like being into the song. She's, yep. And these are these are smart problem solvings. I mean, yeah. I, I've done this with with uh, I've had two situations where I could never get to drummer to really feel great or lock. Mm -hmm. And so I've done this more than once. I've hired Lenny Castro, mm -hmm. who's a great percussionist, right? Has a great feel. Amazing, unbelievable. And I make Lenny stand behind the drummer mm. and play shaker. Oh wow! And it locks. So that drummer now hears that and, he, and that's locked in a way that you can't do it any other way. It's a great now, idea. Yeah. that's just problem solving. Yeah, yeah. Or even with what you said about the singer, I've had the same thing where I just put a mic stand in front of them and say, okay, hold on to the mic stand. All yeah. of a sudden they can sing. If it's the mic which is hanging like this, it's like I, I need something to touch. Yeah. The guitar or even holding the stand. Yeah. These are all little tray things that we've learned, yeah. problem solving, and it's the fun part. Like and sometimes I find that the opposite of my intuition is the right way to go. Because, you know, maybe this is a really, really beautiful song that means a lot. Maybe it's something about death. Maybe it's somebody in the family's died and they've written this song. And the, the, the obvious thing is to bring them back to that place. What did you write? Yeah, what did you feel? Yeah, yeah what did you feel? I found that sometimes that is the worst thing to do. The performance gets suffered, the emotions overcome. And then sometimes I've got the best vocal performance with total distraction, with just like telling jokes, making it so they don't even know, so they're not overthinking and over worried about everything. And they're just in there, yeah, I'm having fun. They sing this really heartfelt song. And people play it back and go, oh my God, this is so emotional. And yet you know inside of your head it was probably the lightest part of the whole day. Isn't it amazing how all these different ways things happen? Yeah. And there's no right or wrong, and we do it all different ways. Yeah. And one time it works, one time it doesn't. Exactly. This is the wonderment of the art of record making, the fun yeah. part of problem solving and figuring out how to do things and being creative. And, you know, I had a, a, a Black Crows record I was making. I think I can say this. And it came to, it was a, basically New Year's. They said, we're going to do, we're going to drop acid. I was like, I'm not dropping acid. I, I go, so I thought about it all day long. I said, okay, come tonight at midnight. We were recording in a house when that was the thing to do, mm -hmm. right? Go somewhere and record in a house somewhere. And I said, we're gonna have an acid session. And I created the most whack stuff I could think of. Like Eddie, the keyboard player, clavinet into an octave divider. One went to, uh, to the Leslie. I put a yeah. symbol in front of that yeah. microphone that was getting off the reflection of the symbol. And then on the other side of the symbol was a snare drum that would only rattle on certain notes, right? Yeah. Then that had a microphone on it. Then the other side went this, and then by the time I was done, I have no idea what it must have been like for them. But the guitar was totally crazily processed. Whatever I could think of that was the craziest I could think of. Okay, Chris, you're gonna have a bullet microphone. And that was processed like all kinds of stuff. And so it was whacked. <laughs> you know, but it was so much fun. And one particular section of a song I could never get, I got that night and I cut it in, you know. And these are all the things that are just, we both have these kind of stories. They're just so much fun. Oh, we don't have anything as crazy as that. It's amazing. I mean, that's fun. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, that's just fun. And, and I really like doing that. And that's what all this is. It's like, it's not better than anybody else's studio or smarter or no one thought of it. It's just my way I create. And a way that makes me feel like I can create. 
because all of us, as I said earlier, it's what are you born what with you the imagined. insecure gene. When you were a kid, this is what you imagined record making was going to be yes. like. Yes. And it's why I want a room like this, mm -hmm. because it is that way. When you're a kid, you imagine what it's going to be like. You have mm -hmm. the posters on the wall, and when I arrive, when I get mm -hmm. to Hollywood, it's going to be like this. And then you walk in, and like, all the fluorescent lights are on, and you look at the walls, and the carpet's kind of beat up, and you're like, it's kind of not cool. It's all pine. It's kind of yeah. like pine wall with some <laughs> rock, and you're like, but if you make it beautiful, and that's why he's there. Mm -hmm. Mickey is there lit because yeah. Mickey represents the wonderment. Mm -hmm. In other words, you and I can argue about something. You could say, I think, make up something. I think that the, an SM57 was the best microphone ever made. And let's say I don't feel that way. I could say you're wrong. It is not the best microphone ever made. And we get an argument. Or what if I say to you, you know what? You're right. But I just wonder, what if... You can't argue with wonder. You can't argue with wonderment. And this should all be predicated and built on the wonderment of innovation and creation and like, what if we did this and what if we did that? And would this work? And is this a stupid idea? I think the day that ends, it ends for us. Right. To me, that's how I live. Like, that's why it's colorful, lit, it's beautiful. That didn't come with a red light on it. I guess, yeah. You know. <laughs> Some of the stuff didn't come the way it looks. This product didn't come with those green LEDs in it. Right. But all the lights and the beauty, it's like it puts you in a space of creativity and wonderment and creation. You know, all the things that we thought it was going to be when we were 13. Yep, I agree. That it wasn't. Yep. I think this is important. I, I really believe that. Do I need these platinum records and these gold records in the wall to, to, to verify how great I am or who I am? Hell no. But when artists and people come here and they see this, they're like, okay, we were right. We can do it. Because you need to have that courage. We need to instill courage in people, a reason to do it, and a reason to take that step. Because mm -hmm. I said before, artists, including us, we're all insecure. We're born with the gene. Here, you're an artistic person. You're talented. You have creativity. Oh, and by the way, you get the insecurity in there too. Sure. Free, no charge, no charge on that one, <laughs> right? Yeah. Comes with it. Yeah. Once you come to terms with that and understand it, you're on your way. Absolutely. That's just what I think. Thank you very much. My pleasure. It's been a lot of fun. Please leave any comments and questions below. I think we covered most of the stuff in here. Yeah, Eric. we covered a lot of it. There's a, there's a, there's more. But I want to keep it for another time. We'll keep it for another time. Yeah, I didn't go down too far on certain things. There's some little secret things in here that makes it fun for the future. I love that idea. Yeah. Thank you. Have a marvelous time recording mixing. See you all again very soon. Leave a bunch of comments and questions below. <laughs>